Don Quixote is thought to be, and many people argue it's one of the greatest works of literature ever written in any language. Uh, you'll see a, a lot of folks will argue, uh, even in that Harold Bloom article that I shared with you, uh, that uh, Shakespeare and Cervantes are the two greatest writers in any language uh, that we have seen, and he even argues that maybe Cervantes is better than Shakespeare. Uh, they were contemporaries, and their writing uh, serves to uh, usher us in to the modern age of literature and the modern age of man as well. Uh, to kind of orient us in time, we are at the end of the time period that this course covers. We are toward the end of the 1500s, early 1600s, so uh, really the uh, beginning of the 17th century is where we're at. And we're in Spain now. Uh, this is a great work of Spanish literature, uh, you know, uh, almost unquestionably known as the greatest work of Spanish literature. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen with you so I can show you some uh, pictures of where we're at in the world. <clears throat> See, we're in central Spain, uh, an area known as Castile, also La Mancha. Uh, and even though we see some picturesque pictures, uh, some picturesque images or scenes uh, of this landscape in these Google image searches. Uh, <clears throat> Castile or La Mancha is not really a, uh, known as a beautiful region. Uh, it, it's kind of, uh, and even the word Mancha, uh, when Cervantes chose it, uh, it has a pun on the, the term stain. Uh, so it's not really known as one of the most beautiful places, uh, but it is really in the heart of Spain, and its people are the heart of Spain. And one of the, it, <clears throat> I've seen one person argue that Castile is where Spain began and where the Spanish Empire ended as well, on the backs of the people of Seville. Uh, so it's it's a heart of industry and the heart of things like that. Um, other places that are important in Don Quixote uh, and in the setting of this work here is the Sierra Morena. Uh, and Don Quixote ends up being in these uh, famous Spanish mountains. Now, these mountains, in my opinion, are very beautiful, but uh, they have a history in the literature of Spain. Uh, this is where Don Quixote goes whenever he assaults members of the Holy Brotherhood. Uh, accusing them of being bandits. Uh, he goes to uh, this little uh, region of mountains here, which border historically uh, the most the area that's commonly known as uh, Christian Spain uh, and the area where the Muslims or the Moors uh, had the most influence in the southern part of Spain. So it serves as a border between uh, the areas of Spain, which are more predominantly Catholic versus historically versus more predominantly Moorish. And this it's kind of like this border region. Uh, and Don Quixote itself, this work of literature and the character, uh, he himself borders between insanity and reality. Sometimes you wonder whether he's the most sane person in the world, and sometimes you wonder, is there anybody who could possibly be more insane and more often? You wonder, is there anybody who could be possibly more insane than Don Quixote? But uh, about half of this first book of Don Quixote uh, is him being up in these mountains. And these mountains are historically known uh, as places for bandits and th places like that. And since Don Quixote takes on this, uh, this self-imposed uh, duty, of ridding the world of bandits and other evildoers, it's the perfect place for him, really. Uh, but ironically, uh, in Spanish reality, in the world, in the real world, he is a bandit because he attacked the members of the Holy Brotherhood. 
um, <clears throat> that holy brotherhood itself uh it we're gonna talk about the history of that holy brotherhood it it has been known historically as uh it, it became known it started out being uh, a band of uh local militias that were put there in order to establish law and order and they were following the rules of god and uh, they were seen as a, a really dignified group of people but by the time of don quixote's uh work of when it was published they were really known for brutality and, and corruption and uh really the murdering people under the guise of law and order uh and, and so people were really terrified of them they basically were you know bandits and stuff like that even though they had official sanction of the king and of the church uh but i think i'm getting a little ahead of myself uh, let's get back to don quixote itself uh so what we have read and what we have read for uh this class. So I had you to read the prologue of Don Quixote in which Cervantes introduces to us his work and tries to lay out uh, a strategy to kind of look at this work and some of his purposes of writing it. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that more in a moment, but I, I think I want to start out with chapter one and uh, the character of Don Quixote, uh, mostly. But there is one thing I want to talk about in regards to the prologue. So we're on page uh, 16 here. So one thing that I think is important to take from the prologue as we're reading the rest of the work is we see uh, Cervantes' purpose in writing this book, or at least he says on the surface of things. Now this is a key to interpreting this book is to know that almost every time that the author says something, he might be lying. So this is one of the first instances in literature in which we actually have an author who is unreliable, who is somebody we cannot trust. So almost every time where Cervantes comes and inserts himself into the narrative, uh, and he says something, and he says, this is the unvarnished truth. He's probably lying. Uh, on the surface of things, Don Quixote and this work of literature is supposed to be a history, which is a factual telling of something that happened in the past. But we know it's not. It's not factual. It's, in fact, a lie. Uh, Don Quixote himself has read all of these histories uh, of these knights errant, and you need to know what that stuff is and what's going on there in order to understand what's going on with this work. Uh, in the 1500s in Spain, one of the most famous uh, types of literature were these romances uh, that were set hundreds of years before in a time period uh, that was far removed from uh, Spain that was modernizing and was truly beginning to be a first global culture. Spain had conquered uh, America or uh, parts of the Americas and the conquistadors, uh, and they had discovered the Aztecs and the Incas and, and then killed them uh, brutally in, in the name of the church and in the name of the whole and then in the name of the king. Uh, and uh, it was becoming a global culture, uh, and, and with all of these things in mind, uh, they had modern cannonry and modern uh, conveniences, and the Industrial Re Revolution wasn't quite there yet, but there were all kinds of little tastes of what could happen in the new world. There were new technologies and things like that being developed, and the world was a far cry uh, from the way things were in the medieval time period that we were just reading. Uh, there were no knights, uh, and, and even for the Decameron, that, that time period was more advanced than this right here. Uh, th there were no knights. There was no code of chivalry. And there, there was no King Arthur or anything like that. People weren't riding around on horseback and armor. 
uh, and, and so Don Quixote was reading all of these works of literature where people were doing that constantly. Uh, and this was a famous genre uh, of literature. It was uh, everybody was reading it in that time period. Uh, and Cervantes in his prologue says that one of the things that he is setting out to do in this work of literature is to make fun of that genre of literature, the genre of literature of these uh, of uh, these knights errant. And a knights errant uh, is a person who goes out in search of adventures, uh, who lives a life of austerity, uh, who tries to live on very little very little money, very little, uh, kind of like what I'm going to do today. I, I'm, you'll notice that I'm in my uh, my woods clothes here. I'm about to go out into the Sipsi wilderness for the next couple of days and live on, you know, live out in the open, in the wild. Uh, but of course, not without all the same things that I have and without all the preparation that I have. Uh, and uh, these knights errant would go do that, and they had a noble purpose of protecting people and of uh, helping maidens who were uh, in danger of being raped uh, or, and uh, helping people who were suffering and were being uh, treated badly or who were victims and, and righting wrongs such as that right there. That was the purpose of knights errant. Uh, and so people were reading about all of these people, but these were historical accounts, but they were actual fictions, okay, uh, that they actually were told about people who never existed at all. Uh, King Arthur probably never existed. Maybe somebody like him existed, but him himself didn't exist. Lancelot, Guinevere, these characters probably didn't exist in reality, but there were probably people like them. You know, but these actual characters and the things they did, Merlin, they didn't exist. Uh, but they were told as if they were real. Uh, and the thing about Don Quixote, the character himself, he reads. Uh, that's one of his character traits. He is caught up in his library, and he is constantly reading. Uh, he is reading these histories, and he starts to believe that they're real, that the world is full of dragons, that the world is full of giants, that the world is full of knights who are trying to right these wrongs and these injustices. And, and he imagines that he himself is one of them. So in this prologue right here, and I'm on page 15, uh, <clears throat> Cervantes criticizes this genre of uh, chivalric romances uh, that uh, Don Quixote is trying to embody. That is one of the first things that he does. Uh, and uh, he says right here that he is worried and he, he finds writing this prologue as an author very difficult to do because uh, the generic conventions of writing a book of chivalry uh, involve him having all kinds of sonnets and poems and aphorisms and uh, showing that he has read all of these various works of all these great authors and stuff like that. And he himself has done none of that work. Uh, he, he just wrote a book for fun, basically. You know, and so he's like, I don't want to do all this stuff right here. Uh, and he invents this guy who has a conversation with him uh, and tells him, look, dude, you don't need to have any of that stuff right there anyway uh, in your book right there. He says, your book doesn't need these things at the beginning. You don't need to have a pro prologue that shows how learned and how smart you are uh, because – from the beginning to end, the purpose of Don Quixote, the book that you are writing, is an invective against the books of chivalry, which Aristotle never dreamed of, and St. Basil never mentioned, and Cicero never came across. So the purpose of writing Don Quixote for Cervantes 
is to criticize these books of literature that uh, are truly a modern invention. Okay, uh, And so the subject of Don Quixote is wholly modern. It's something that wasn't around back in the day. So why in the world do you need to start quoting Aristotle and these eternal truths and stuff like that, like all of these people who wrote these chivalric books did? You don't need it because you know what? What you're doing is wholly modern. It's a wholly new thing. Uh, so it says, uh, since the work of yours is only concerned to destroy the authority and influence the books of chivalry and joy in the world among the general public, there isn't any need to go begging maxims from philosophers, counsel from Holy Scripture, and all of that stuff. Uh, just write straightforward and write something harmonious and funny and witty, depicting what in your mind is the very best of your ability, setting out your ideas. You should make sure that you make people laugh when they read your histories, and the jovial man laughs even more. The simpleton is not discouraged, so simple people should be able to enjoy this work. Uh, Serious-minded people should enjoy this work. Wise people should enjoy the. So, in short, uh, just focus on breaking down those books of chivalry and have fun is one of the things that he's saying here. Uh, so, that lays out kind of the foundation for the work right there. We see from that prologue that... Uh, he constantly is undermining uh, this genre of, sh of uh, chivalric romances, and he's also calling into question his authority as an author, uh, which was you know inventive at the time. And he's also establishing this book as a really modern work in that sense, as an invective against the books of chivalry that are so famous or popular literature there in that sense. Uh, so we know that it's a, a that the work in a lot of cases is going to be sarcastic, uh, and a lot of the things that he's going to say are lies, uh, and, and should be seen. And sometimes he's going to say things that, on the surface of things, he says are truth, but are actually also lies. So, uh, really interesting thoughts to keep in mind about the narrator, who is a character in the story, as well. Cervantes himself, uh, and that's why uh, in on the quiz I have Cervantes listed as one of the cats uh, that you need to talk about. It's because he's so important to the work. Uh, so some things to keep in mind about Cervantes uh, and about his history, uh, since we're talking about him a little bit, is. Um, now, I've answered a lot of these questions here that are on uh, the quiz here. I asked, answered some of them last time. I talked about night errantry, which is a practice that Don Quixote espouses. I talked about Rosinante and Dapple. And I did mention Amadis of Gaul. He is a famous sh historical chivalric knight. He's one of the most famous. Uh, his was the first work of its kind uh, that wrote the first his, uh, romantic uh, chivalric romance uh, of the modern age. Um, I suppose this is one thing I haven't talked about yet. Hidalgos. Uh, these are Spanish nobility with no hereditary title and sometimes poor. Okay, So Don Quixote is one of these people. He is one of the Spanish nobility. He has no hereditary title. He's, a, he's been usually recently named a noble. Uh, and, and a lot of these folks were uh, oftentimes poor because they didn't have any land or anything. So they were noble in name only. Uh, so this is what I was talking about in the quiz here. Cervantes is narrator of this story, not his life outside of the story. So as the narrator of the story, that's what I was doing just a second ago in talking about his character in the prologue. Uh, we see that uh, in some ways he says, 
this is the most noble and honorable of knights, you know, but uh, as we see pretty quickly, Cervantes is pretty critical of Don Quixote and portrays him as pretty destitute. Uh, but at the same time, any time that, that Cervantes does something uh, and, and establishes one thing, let's say he establishes Don Quixote as mad, he establishes Don Quixote as ignorant, as foolish, as stupid, later on, Cervantes, because of the nature of this work here, is going to undermine that idea and show Don Quixote as actually sometimes the most sane person, sometimes the most noble, the most distinguished person. Uh, and, and so it's really interesting how this narrative constantly undermines itself, and, and the character of the narrator is such, uh, is that type. Now, uh, one of the things on the quiz uh, that it asks you to do is to talk about Don Quixote de la Mancha, details from two different chapters from book one. So the chapters that I had you to read of Don Quixote were chapters one through four. So far, you've read those. So here we are on page 25. So if you have your book, go ahead and open it up to page 25, and you'll begin to see the character of Don Quixote. These first four chapters of the book establish who Don Quixote is. They establish his character, his situation, and they also establish uh, the basics of the plot going forward. Um, we learn chapter one is pretty important. It gets the setting in a village in La Mancha, and I already showed you where La Mancha was, the name of which I cannot quite recall. So look at the character of the narrator there. The narrator oftentimes doesn't know everything. Uh, it seems like he didn't even bother to look it back up and to try to find what, what the name of this village was. From the first sentence, we see that. But later on, he will say uh, that uh, right here at the end of this, at the end of the paragraph, look. But this doesn't matter much as far as our story is concerned, provided that the narrator doesn't stray one inch from the truth. And I put in the margin LOL because he's constantly straying from the truth in that sense right there. He's constantly lying. Uh, <clears throat> and he's constantly not doing a good job of being a good historian. And he's doing it on purpose in order to make us laugh if we're paying attention. Uh, <clears throat> he's doing it for a laugh. Uh, and to call in to question anybody who takes these kinds of works seriously, like Don Quixote, who, who reads these histories and takes them seriously and who thinks that they're real. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we see Don Quixote lives in La Mancha. Uh, he's one of those country gentlemen or hidalgos who keep a lance and a rack, an ancient leather shield, a scrawny hack, and a greyhound for coursing. Uh, so th there's these images of a former life, this ancient leather shield, a lance and a rack. Uh, there's these images of an ancient life of people who once were noble, who once were out and fighting and doing things, but now uh, all of that stuff has kind of gone to rust. And we see Don Quixote as that way. We see that he's on the verge of poverty, yet he, on the surface of things, or at least in name, he is a, a, a noble, uh, but that's only in name only. So we get this establishment between reality versus imagined world right there, and that's going to be one of the key themes in this work right here, this idea and the contrast between the real world versus our imagined world. Uh, and Don Quixote is a master of the imagined world, but not so much the real world. Um, <clears throat> we see the character of the food he eats. He eats a midday stew with rather more shin of beef than leg of lamb, the leftovers for supper most nights, lardy eggs on Saturdays, lentil broth on Fridays, and an occasional pigeon as a Sunday treat. That ate up three quarters of his income. So this modest meals that he's eating eats almost every cent of money that he has right there. 
uh, and the rest of his money goes for cheap clothes, okay? Uh, we see he's got a housekeeper, he's got a niece, uh, and, and these characters are going to come into play later. Uh, he's nearly 50, which in that day and age, you know, 50 years old is not a spring chicken. Uh, life expectancy wasn't all that long back in the day. And in fact, in the time period in which this work was written, it's another plague time period. Uh, the the plague is ravaging this country again. And this is, even though this is 200 years after uh, the Decameron, there is a new onset of plague going on as this work is being written and, and as this work is set here uh, in, in which uh, it's recorded that this is probably the second most deadly plague in uh, history and it was mostly centered in this area uh, of Spain. There's not a lot of discussion of it in this work itself, but it's a backdrop of this work right here. People didn't live all that long in short uh, and so I think it's important to note that Don Quixote is near death in this time period. Uh, he is toward the end of his life for sure. He had a robust constitution, dried up flesh and a withered face. And he was an early riser and a keen huntsman. Now, even in this work right here, we're not even sure what Don Quixote's name is. Quijada or Quesada, as if he were a jawbone or a cheesecake. So you see that the narrator, his character, is to constantly make fun of his main character, okay? But at the same time, he makes fun of him, but then he praises him. Uh, but whenever he praises him, we're led to wonder, is he being sarcastic? And a lot of times, he is sarcastic. So a lot of character traits of the narrator, I'm giving you an answer to the quiz right there and talking about this. Uh, concerning this detail of his name, he can't even figure out what his name is. There's some discrepancy among the authors who've written on the subject. Uh, okay. So uh, another backdrop and thing that Cervantes is talking about in this work right here is his criticism of the nobility. Now, uh, and, and he, in many ways, he praises the lower classes as well because Sancho Panza, we're going to see him coming in later, is in a lot of ways one of the most memorable characters in this work right here. And even Cervantes himself it says right here at the end of the prologue, he says on page 17, uh, I do want your thanks, good reader, for making you acquainted with the famous Sancho Panza, uh, who was Don Quixote's squire. Uh, he says, in whom I believe I give you a compendium of all the squirrelly fun scattered throughout the whole troop of vain books of chivalry. Uh, so those famous books of chivalry, that genre rarely talked about the squire. And this is one of the ways in which Don Quixote, uh, the work Don Quixote by Cervantes, is novel uh, because he takes this lowest of classes of people that's hereby been ignored in literature, and he presents him as a worthy character. He, and he, one of the reasons is because he's so fun and hilarious. Sancho Panza is absolutely hilarious, and we're going to talk about it later. Uh, but Cervantes uh, is criticizing the nobility and, and presenting these hidalgos and it should be noted that the Hidalgos, even as impoverished and as ennoble as they were, they were exempt from taxes, okay? Uh, and during this time period, one of the reasons for the decline of Spain from the, one of the greatest empires in the world during this time period, there was a period of uh, tense economic decline, is because they started taxing the poor so much because they couldn't tax the nobility. They started taxing the poor so much that these poor people, they, they abandoned the land. A lot of them went over to America and immigrated to America or other places. And a consequence of this is that 
there wasn't enough food to go around. There was a huge famine in the land because there weren't enough people to work the land. Uh, they couldn't pay them to work the land because the taxes were so bad. Uh, and so uh, this is some of the irony going on here. Uh, and so there's a distrust uh, in the idleness of the nobility. These nobles couldn't work that because of their station, they couldn't actually go out and work the land, so they had to hire people to work the land, but there was nobody to work the land. Uh, and so what did they do with their time? This Hidalgo took to reading books of chivalry. So he didn't have anything to do with his time. He could have went off and hunted, but he likes to read here. And he read them with such relish and enthusiasm that he almost forgot about even the running of his property. Uh, and he goes out and he spends all of his money and he sells his land in order to buy books. Now, in one sense, uh, we're led to criticize Don Quixote for doing something like this, okay, for going out and spending all of his time reading books and not thinking about the land uh, and spending his money on books. But on the other hand, okay, Cervantes has to see Don Quixote is somebody that he really likes and somebody he can relate to, okay? Cervantes, keep in mind, he read all of these books too, okay? Cervantes was very poor. He had to have read these books. He was almost destitute poor his whole life. He read all these books. So he's criticizing Don Quixote for reading these books, but it's tongue-in-cheek because he read them himself, Okay? Uh, and he had to have spent almost everything that he had in buying books. So in one sense, he's criticizing Don Quixote, but he did this himself. Cervantes loves books. I love books. So in one sense, it's like, you crazy, dude. You know, but we all, if we love books, we can relate to Don Quixote for doing that. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> Don Quixote... His problem, really, Don Quixote's problem, I think, with Cervantes is that he takes these books so seriously. So think about it. In this class, I've been asking you to read all of these books. I've been saying, read the Decameron. Take it seriously. Think about the meaning of the word. The author had an intention. The author was so smart. Don Quixote is reading these books, and he's saying, oh, gosh. There must be some meaning behind this work. There must be something so intelligent in this work right here. Uh, but he's reading these books of chivalry, which were very poorly written a lot of times. Uh, and he's trying to understand these lines right here. And you get some of these lines right here. Read this line that's taken from a book of chivalry. The lofty heavens, which with their stars divinely fortify you, your divinity, and make you meritorious of the merits merited by your greatness. You can see that that line doesn't make any sense. It's very poorly written. The meritorious merits merited. <laughs> That's very bad writing, and it doesn't make any sense. And Don Quixote is sitting there in his study and trying to understand what is it? Have you ever found yourself doing that as you're reading some work of literature, maybe for even this class? I do not understand that. Maybe you found yourself doing that with this very book here. Uh, but the problem is that Don Quixote doesn't realize that that's just bad writing. Um, and it's the same way whenever he reads these characters here. And he says, uh, it's time and time again undermined this idea of these people these knights going out and living only on the herbs of the field and and, and with no money. And, and then when Don Quixote runs into the innkeeper, the innkeeper's like, well, they, they these knights had to have carried money with them. How else would they have eaten? Now, how else would they have done anything? Uh, and so Don Quixote is constantly faced with the reality that these books that he is reading are actually, even though they say they're histories, they're not true at all. Uh, and that's one of his problems is that he has trouble discerning between the real and the unreal. Okay. Um, and that's what I say down here at the bottom right here. Uh, he reads so much of these works 
uh, that, in short, our Hidalgo was soon so absorbed that his nights were spent reading from dusk till dawn and his days from dawn till dusk until the lack of sleep and the excess of reading withered his brain, and he went mad. Everything he read in his books took possession of his imagination, from enchantments to fights to battles to challenges to wounds to sweet nothings to love affairs to storms and impossible absurdities. The idea that this whole fabric of famous fabrications was real so established itself in his mind that no history in the world was truer than for him. So we see the character of his madness here in chapter 1 on page 27. Um, we see that he's taken all of these things that are happening in this work right here that most people are able to say, well, that's just fiction, right? Don Quixote has a problem. Can you imagine, you know, reading uh, or watching a movie, uh, The Chronicles of Narnia, or watching The Lord of the Rings, or watching Game of Thrones, and imagining that uh, that there might be a White Walker over here at any point? Okay, can you imagine taking on that mentality that you yourself are Daenerys Targaryen? You know what? I can. Uh, you know what? A lot of people actually do that, okay? So in one sense, Cervantes is criticizing Don Quixote for doing this right here. But I want you to step back and say, is he really so mad? Are we not guilty of that same thing? And Cervantes has his tongue in cheek as well. Because guess what? Imagine nowadays people who are just like that. Have you ever been to a Star Trek convention, okay? Have you ever been to a Renaissance fair? Have you ever been uh, to whatever or whatever? There's all kinds of these little conventions, cosplay and stuff like that, where people pretend they envision that they are characters from Batman, that they are characters from these comic books and stuff like that. And sometimes they live their lives in that way. If you ever – on Instagram, some people are famous because of how close they look like the Joker or how much they look like uh, you know, Worf. From Star Trek or something like that, how often they go out dressed in that way. People actually live that way. Uh, think about other ways in which this can draw second-level connections to nowadays, and you can see how Don Quixote might not be as mad as he says he is uh, in one sense, and how you might have met people just like Don Quixote in your life. Think about conspiracy theories, okay, and how some people, especially political conspiracy theories about how some people nowadays uh, constantly think that these things are the absolute unvarnished truth, okay, to such a degree that they act out in crazy ways. Can you think of anything? Okay. What about the insurrection on the United States Capitol that happened recently? We have the case of the QAnon theories. If you don't know anything about that right there, the QAnon theorists think that there, is a, there was a group of, of uh, politicians in Washington, mostly Democrats, but later it became people like Mike Pence and other Republicans who, who were fighting against Donald Trump. Who Donald Trump was the hero who was fighting against these uh, people who thought there was a cabal – uh, who had a sex trafficking ring going on in Washington. All of the Democrats were running this sex trafficking ring, and Donald Trump was trying to eliminate that sex trafficking ring that was going on in Washington, and he was fighting this secret mission against all of these people here. And they believed it so much, some of them did, that they went in and stormed the Capitol to try to uh, kick the Democrats out of Washington. Uh, and so these people believe these things to such a degree that they murdered that, – that some of them died in, in the service of this idea, uh, and, and some of them are in prison still yeah, in that sense right there. But it, some people live a fictional life, and they, they can't see anything but this fictional life here. And so you can kind of see these things going on even in modern society. So the basic premise of this work comes from here, uh, uh, and, and thanks for contributing that idea there, Caitlin. Uh, there's this idea about the the Holocaust isn't real, and, and th these conspiracy theories go around. 
Uh, and there's also the idea of about the flat earth theory as well, you know, and a lot of people strongly believe in that. Uh, you know, even I think it was Kanye West says that he believes in that. I mean, like that's somebody we know, you know, who believes this idea that's obviously false, right, by everything that we can do to prove it. But let's get to the basic premise of this work right here. Uh, we got Don Quixote has conceived the strangest notion that for the increase of his honor, for the common good, he is going to take on armor and he's going to go out of his home in search of adventures and practice those activities that he knew from his book and redress all kinds of grievances, expose himself to perils and dangers that he would overcome and thus gain eternal fame and renown. And maybe one day he's going to be crowned the Emperor of Trezabond at the very least, through the might of his mighty arm, even though we already know he's a withered and gaunt old man. And he got such pleasure from this that he hastened to put it into practice. And his first step is to clean up an old suit of armor that belonged to his forefathers, covered in rust and mold. And he puts on this awful, uh, <clears throat> he scoured and mended it, and then he puts on this visor made out of cardboard right here uh, on his helmet. And he goes out, and he's got it tied on with all these ribbons and things. Uh, and uh, he, he takes this old horse called that he names Rosinante, which is really an old hack. It's almost dead here, uh, the first and foremost of all the hacks in the world. And he renames himself Don Quixote. So that's not his real name. He imagines that name. So... <clears throat> And having done this, he gives himself a love, a uh, an enamored love. He invents a love for himself. Uh, <laughs> he invents a love for himself, which is Dulcinea del Toboso, who we know already is really a peasant, a peasant who maybe he fell in love with, but she had no idea who he is. So this is his fantasy. Uh Okay, now let's think about this a little bit here. This is absolutely insane. He's going to go out and uh, it, he might as well be going out today in 21st century America and, and putting on a suit of armor and getting on an old horse and going out and trying to fight, uh, you know, uh, Ford F-150s in the middle of Main Street of Starkville, Mississippi, because the people here had never seen anybody in armor, even in this time period, okay? Imagine him doing that nowadays. All right, that's all well and good, right? He's clearly insane. This is supposed to be a lot of fun. But th let's think about it on the other level, okay? And I, want, I invite you to think about this as final thoughts as you're reading the rest of this work, okay? The country of Spain is corrupt. The country of Spain has lost all moral value. The nobility are abusing the peasants. While they themselves are, uh, you know, are living their own lives, uh, this noble, for instance, is not living a very nice life. But really, the higher nobles in society, who we'll talk about later on in this work, are basically running the society. They have all of the wealth, and they're taxing the poor people to death. Uh, the country is in a state of great decline, a and religion. The people who are in that practice right there, the knights of that holy brotherhood there are robbing people and summarily executing them to take their money. Uh, people are corrupt. This country is corrupt in every way. Don Quixote says, I'm going to go out and do good things. I'm going to go out and right wrongs. I'm going to live by a moral code, and I'm not going to break it. I'm going to live by a moral code, which is ethically right. I'm going to help people who are in trouble. I'm going to help people who are, are in distress, and I'm going to try to live a life of honor and dignity and nobility. That is crazy to go out and do that. Why is that crazy? Why is it crazy to go out and live a life of honor and dignity and nobility? In one sense, why, why would that be so bad? You know, uh, so that so Don Quixote creates that kind of level of dissonance there. In one sense, it's absolutely insane to do these things, 
Uh, but on the other sense, he's got like a good purpose. But as we have seen already in these first few chapters, because he has such trouble telling the difference between reality, what's real and what's fiction, it makes for great fun. And he uh, he does some crazy things like, uh, well, we don't have time to talk about it right now, but you have read it already through chapter four. So uh, without any further ado, I want to make sure we know what to do next time before I run out of time. Uh, make sure that you read uh, Don Quixote. Uh, you're going to, right now. You should have finished through chapter four, uh, and by next time you will have read through chapter eleven. You read parts of chapter twelve and thirteen right there over the weekend. So I invite you to have a lot of fun, laugh along with me, and as you meet Sancho Panza uh, and he's drinking his wine glass and passing out among the stars. I hope that you enjoy these hilarious times, and we'll talk to you on Monday, my friends.